Acts chapter 13. Are you there? I heard the story of a young preacher who was driving home with his wife after church one Sunday morning. And uh, it was pretty quiet on the ride home, and the preacher was reflecting on the morning services, and uh, he thought that things went pretty well. He thought the sermon was, was pretty good, and he felt like people responded well. And it got him kind of thinking a little bit more about things. And, and he, he, was, he uh, got to thinking about, man, all the great preachers that are out there in the world and, and everything, and, and where he measured up a little bit. And, and so after a long moment of silence, he turned to his wife and he asked and said, Honey, how many great preachers do you think are in the world? And without missing a beat, she said, one less than you're probably thinking. <laughs> I get the privilege of being a preacher. And I say that understanding that full well. You have to realize my journey to become a preacher uh, was a unique one in a sense. You would think, oh, he's just following in his dad's footsteps. Of course, it was inevitable that Mark was going to be a preacher. You couldn't be more wrong. Uh, when I graduated high school, my plan was to be, of all things, a math teacher. But my parents required us to go to one year of Bible college, and so off to Central Christian College of the Bible in Moberly, Missouri, I went, where I had a preaching class, and I fell in love with it. Now, I have to back up and tell you the very first sermon I ever preached. It was when I was a sophomore in high school. And our church had Sunday morning services and Sunday night services. And during the summer, Dad wondered if I would be willing to preach. And so I thought, oh, sure, how hard can this preaching thing be, right? And uh, so I worked on a sermon. And, and I can tell you, I can remember what I prepared that night to preach was a sermon on Samson. He's one of my favorite Old Testament heroes at the time and uh, preached this sermon, wrote this sermon about Samson, was getting ready to preach it, uh, walked up to deliver the sermon, had my Bible there and was getting ready to preach the sermon that I had prepared only to find that my notes were nowhere to be found. The sermon lasted six minutes. <laughs> that was the first sermon I ever preached. Uh, this one's going to be a little longer than six minutes. Hope that's okay. But today what we're getting ready to study here this morning is the Apostle Paul's very first sermon. And let me just say, his sermon went so much better than my first sermon ever did. In fact, his sermon, his very first sermon has gone so much better than a lot of my um, subsequent uh, follow, following sermons that I've preached here at Burnside too. But that led me to ask you this question, who's the best preacher you've ever heard. And, and I want you to think on that. Now, throughout my years, I've, I've got to, 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 uh, to listen to some really great preachers. I have uh, heard in person Francis Chan preach. I've listened to Bob Russell preach sermons in person. I've listened to James McDonald in person preach sermons. But the greatest preacher to ever live, of course, is Jesus Christ. I think you have to agree with that. And I think then you have to include after him Simon Peter and the Apostle Paul. But all of that to say this, apart from Jesus Christ himself, the messenger is nothing. What matters is the message. It doesn't matter the one bringing or delivering the message. What matters is the message that they bring. And that's what we're going to see here in the first recorded sermon of Paul. Do you remember where we last left off? Paul and Barnabas were um, leaving their home church of Antioch. Remember, it was 300 miles north of Jerusalem. And up there in Antioch in Syria is where Paul and Barnabas made their home church. They were leaders in the church in Antioch. And what happens is they were being commissioned by the Holy Spirit and sponsored by the church in Antioch to begin what was to be their first of three missionary journeys. And so Paul and Barnabas left Antioch to sail to the island of Cyprus. There they come to Salamis, and they end up traveling all the way to Paphos, and they're going to leave Paphos and head north. And that's where Acts chapter 13, our text today, is going to pick up. 
So let's begin reading and studying, and then we'll apply our text a little bit later. Starting in verse 13 of Acts chapter 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Just two things I want to emphasize from verse 13. First of all, did you notice the description that was given of this missions trip leader? It was described as a missions trip that was being led by Paul and his companions. If you notice early on in the uh, chapter, I believe, 12 of Acts, it's always described as Barnabas and Saul. Now here in Acts chapter 13, the switch gets flipped, and now it's going to be referred to as Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and his companions. Clearly, something has happened, and now Paul is the looked-to leader to the ministry to the Gentiles. Uh, Simon Peter is still the, is considered the leader of the Jews, the one who's reaching out to the Jews for Christ. Um, but Paul is now reaching out to the Gentiles. Second thing I want you to notice here is at the end of verse 13, it simply says, but John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. And we read that and we think, oh, that's no big deal. Well, I want to kind of explain to you again who John Mark is. Uh, this was the same John Mark who joined Paul and Barnabas. Remember when the church in Antioch raised an offering and delivered it to the church in Jerusalem because they were going to experience a famine? And it was Paul and Barnabas who delivered the money that was raised in Antioch down to the church in Jerusalem. And as they were returning back to their home church in Antioch, they brought with them from Jerusalem a young man by the name of John Mark, who was also Barnabas's cousin. Well, this same John Mark would be the one who would later go on to write the gospel according to Mark. This was the John Mark who was described in Acts chapter 13, verse 5, as Barnabas and Paul's helper on this missions trip. And eight verses into this first missionary journey, we read that John Mark leaves the missions trip and heads back to Jerusalem. And that's it. No other details are given. What's up with that? What's happening here? It kind of makes me think of it maybe this way. Husbands, have you ever made your wife angry and then she gave you the silent treatment? And then you asked her, honey, are you okay? What's wrong? And her response was, nothing. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Has that ever happened to you? Two things happen when she says that. You instantly know, first of all, that everything is not fine. And furthermore, she is not fine. And that's kind of what I think is going on here in Acts chapter 13, verse, uh, thir uh, verse 13. Um, I think it's kind of like John Mark is leaving. It's kind of mentioned as a matter of fact. But clearly we're going to soon realize that it was not okay with the Apostle Paul that John Mark abandoned them and returned back to Jerusalem. Now we don't know why John Mark left. Maybe he missed home. Maybe he got sick. Who knows? But one thing that we do know, everything was not fine for the Apostle Paul and about his and John Mark's decision to leave. And we'll learn more about that because it's going to come to a head in Acts chapter 15 when on the second missionary trip, John Mark wants to go with them. And Paul's going to be like, nah, uh you left us high and dry on the first one. And it's going to cause some conflict, and we'll talk more about that in Acts chapter 15. But kind of put that in your back pocket. Verse 14, here we go. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them and said, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. I want to stop right here just for a moment and show you a map. Paul and Barnabas arrive in Perga from Paphos. And there, once they get to Perga, which was a port city, they travel 100 miles inland to Pisidian Antioch, not to be confused with their hometown of Antioch in Syria. Um, 
This general region where Pisidian Antioch and all of these cities were located, the general area, uh, area the general region was referred to as Galatia. And uh, later, Paul would write a letter to these young believers that would be passed around to the several churches that he would plant throughout the region of Galatia, and that book would be called Galatians. And maybe if you've never studied it, or maybe if you're new to the faith, you might be tempted to think that there was a city called Galatia. I mean, after all, there's a city called Ephesus, and there's a city called Philippi, and there was a city called Corinth, Corinth. but uh, there was no city called Galatia. It was the name of the region that contained all of these cities and the churches where Paul started them. And this Pisidian Antioch was one of the cities that was located in the region of Galatia. Now, I found this interesting. Maybe you will too, I hope. Why in the world would Paul and Barnabas immediately once arriving to Perga, why would their first destination be 100 miles away to Pisidian Antioch? Why wouldn't they just minister to some of the pre-existing uh, cities and towns that were much closer? Well, there's a theory that exists among scholars for the reason why Paul and Barnabas go up to Pisidian Antioch. And the reason that they think that they went there first was because Paul was in poor health when he arrived in Perga. And Pisidian Antioch was at a higher elevation. It was considered to be in the low mountain region, and many people would often go up to the mountain region or high hill area of Pisidian Antioch to escape the malaria fevers that afflicted the people at the lowland levels. And so some scholars have suggested that Paul went there first because he was trying to get some relief from whatever it was that was ailing him, but it was also a point where he was able to minister. Now let me show you what kind of condition Paul was when he arrived because he hints at it as he's writing his letter to the Galatian churches. He hints at it in Galatians chapter 4, verse 13, and he says this, But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached uh, the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Isn't that interesting? We don't know for certain, but it would seem that God guided Paul to Pisidian Antioch through some kind of illness, and that God used that illness to bring him to Pisidian Antioch, where he was able to minister to the people there while also recovering. And so he comes to Pisidian Antioch, and he goes into the synagogue to attend worship service, to go to church, and did you notice that as he's sitting in the church service, those leading the church service recognize it's the great Paul, it's the great Saul of Tarsus who studied under Gamaliel, and he's here with us. And so he, they ask and say, hey, would you like to say anything and address, the, address us here? And so Paul's like, well, certainly I will. And that begins Paul's first sermon in verse 16. Now, today we're going to kind of go through his sermon. We're going to outline it. It has one point. And one major point of Paul's sermon is this, God has a plan. And what Paul is going to do to, with his audience, he's going to walk them through God's plan throughout all of history. And he's going to show them, look, God has had a plan. He, it hasn't changed. It hasn't altered. God's in control. And he's going to show in detail that. And um, what's interesting is that um, when he gets to the end of his sermon, he's going to show that Jesus Christ was a part of that plan all along. Okay? But let's start where Paul starts. He says, hey, look, God has a plan. Even in the midst of suffering, God has a plan. Look at verse 16 and 17. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen to me. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, God led them from Egypt. Now Paul just covered 400 years of history in two sentences. I'm going to take a little longer to remind you of what it is he's talking about. Paul is reminding his audience about how the Jewish people got their start and where they came from. And if you remember a little bit about the history of the Israelites, then you know that they started out as slaves in Egypt. Well, how did they get to Egypt? 
Well, it all started with a guy by the name of Joseph. Remember Joseph? Joseph had some brothers. They were jealous of Joseph because he was loved by his dad more than his brothers were. And Joseph got this beautiful coat of many colors. Remember that? And his brothers were so jealous of Joseph that they threw him into a pit, stripped him of his garment, and then they eventually sold him into slavery. And those slave traders took Joseph to Egypt, and that's how Joseph ended up in Egypt. Well, through a long series of events, Joseph rises to prominence. He goes from being a slave in Egypt to now being second in command right behind Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And that was a good thing. That was part of God's plan to use Joseph, even in the midst of suffering. God had a plan. And how he used Joseph was he used Joseph to prepare for a famine that would was going to come. And Joseph was able to invite his family, who were still living in the, uh, the land of Canaan. He invited them to come and stay in Egypt and be there with him. And so they did during the famine. And you know what happens next, right? They multiply. Millions and millions and millions of descendants came from Joseph's family. And uh, that took a, a, a great amount of time. But eventually what ended up happening was the new pharaoh in town, after Joseph had died, a new pharaoh took over, and he saw the Israelites, these millions of people, as a threat, and he decided to enslave them and uh, take advantage of them and treat them cruelly. And that took... 400 years of slavery that until, until one day uh, when God chose to use Moses and spoke to Moses through a burning bush and said, go get my people and bring them out of Egypt and back here to the land of, of promise that I'm going to give to them. And so Moses, if you remember, he goes back, talks to Pharaoh, let my people go, ten plagues later, and he finally does let the people go. That's what these two verses are all entailing. 400 years of Jewish history. But the point is this. The Israelites started out as slaves. And, and, and why were they slaves? I thought they were God's chosen people. Yes, they were. But God had a plan even in the midst of their suffering. All of that to say this. I want to remind you this morning that God has a plan for your pain as well. The disease that you were diagnosed with, the messy divorce that you've endured, the fact that you have kids who you raised to know the Lord, but now that they're grown, they've kind of walked away from their faith, none of that has taken God by surprise. He's accounted for it. He's made plans to account for it. And He has a plan in the midst of your suffering and your pain. But here's the problem. The suffering of the Israelites lasted a long time, 400 years. Sometimes God's plans take a while, but there are lessons to learn along the way. And while God's plans are waiting to be accomplished, there's some definite refining that God has in mind for you. He's molding your character. He is purifying you. He's sanctifying you. He's strengthening you for what is to come. And He's making you ready to receive what he has planned to give you. God has a plan even in my suffering. That's Paul's first point. Here's Paul's second point. God has a plan even when I'm rebelling. Look at verse 18. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with the Israelites in the wilderness. So the Israelites were being led out of Egypt by Moses and he brings them to Mount Sinai and once they are in, at the base of Mount Sinai ready to move on to the promised land, God tells Moses to select 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes and have them go spy out the land that God was to give to them. There was one problem, however. There were strong enemies that needed to be evicted from the promised land before they could inhabit it. And uh, those 12 men came back, and out of the 12, 10 of the 12 spies gave a negative report. They, they, they went to the land, they said, we can't do it. We've looked at the people living there. There is no way that we can overtake them and evict them and, and occupy the land. They're, they're too strong. They're too mighty. And so they convinced the people not to trust in God and not to do what he asked them to do. And because of their rebellion against God, because of their refusal to believe what God had planned for them, guess what? 40 years of wandering in the wilderness was to happen. 
You see, the plan remained the same even after 40 years of rebellion, right? Even after, even after they refused to trust God and there was 40 years of consequence, the plan was always the same. There's a land waiting for you. A land that was flowing with milk and honey. Or as I like to think of it, a land full of Doritos and Diet Coke, right? God has a plan, and His plan for you is to inhabit this beautiful land that is filled with blessings. And until you're willing to follow me and trust me, we're going to have to deal with your rebellion a little bit. But God's plans never change even when I'm rebelling against what God would want for me in my life. Isn't that good news, you guys? I don't know about you, but as I look back over my life, there have been times where my faith has not been what it should be. And yet God continued to faithfully love me and provide for me even in the midst of my rebellion against him. God has a plan even when I'm suffering, even when I'm rebelling. Here's the third thing that Paul says. God has a plan against my enemies. Look at verse 19. When God had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. So Paul is finally summarizing verses 13 through 19, and he says, I'm covering 450 years of history. And uh, you have to understand that for 40 years, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, and during that time, Moses dies, right? Uh, their faithful leader who brought them out of Egypt, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness as a punishment, Moses ends up dying. And then there's a transition in leadership. Joshua was the new designated leader for the Israelites. And Joshua was a mighty warrior. He was like a general in God's army, so to speak. Uh, he led the people into the promised land after 40 years. And he entered the land of Canaan. And he defeated the enemies who lived there so that God's people could obtain the promised land. That leads me to ask you this question. What enemy have you done battle with this past week? You see, Joshua led the Israelites up into the promised land and he had to evict all of those guys who were living there. And they were some tough enemies. But listen, even in the midst of that, God has a plan against my enemies. He's made preparations, he's made plans for the enemy that I'm going to do battle with. And that led me to ask you this question, what enemy have you done battle with this past week? Just a word of caution, your enemy is not a person. Your enemy is not the person that you work with. The enemy is, is not the person that you live with. The enemy is not someone that you go to church with. Your enemy is not a person. Paul makes that really clear in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, for our struggle, for our battle, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other humans. That's not who we're at war with. Our war is against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. So in short, your enemy is Satan. That's who your enemy is. And he's attacking you in three ways. The first way that Satan likes to attack you is he wants to attack you physically. He might be attacking you with a disease such as cancer or Alzheimer's. Remember, He's a thief, and he wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy you. He wants to attack you physically. He's a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour, right? He wants to attack you physically. But the second way that he's attacking you is he's attacking you mentally by causing doubts to rise up into your mind and in your heart. It was the same way that he attacked Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Remember, God had one rule, don't eat of that tree. And Satan shows up in the form of a snake and says, did God really say that you guys can't eat that? He was attacking them mentally, causing doubts and questions to rise up in their minds. But then third way that he likes to attack is he likes to attack spiritually by tempting you to do things that God has said, don't do. And so you have enemies that include addiction and lust and gossip, and slander, and a critical heart, and a bad negative attitude. Those are your enemies. 
And it's clear that that's one way that Satan likes to attack. That's how he tried to attack Jesus when he was in the wilderness fasting and praying for 40 days. And he came to him and he tempted him. And Jesus was able to resist the, the spiritual attacks that Satan was offering. Those are your enemies. That's the way that Satan is going to attack you. And so even in the midst of how you are being attacked and the enemies that you face, God has a plan. And I hope that's reassuring for you. He had a plan for the Israelites as they were going to have to, to uh, uh, attack and defeat the enemies occupying the promised land. And I have to warn you this morning that as God deals with your enemies, the ways that, God, that Satan is tempting you and, and trying to attack you, the way that God is going to deal with those things is probably going to be unconventional and a little bit weird. It's going to be unusual. I want to remind you this morning of one way that God defeated the enemies in the promised land. <laughs> you remember Jericho? In Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, God told Joshua, the leader of the Israelites, to go into the promised land and to attack Jericho first. That they were going to destroy Jericho first. And uh, the reason for that is because Jericho was the, uh, like the big bully on the block. Jericho was the most heavily fortified city in the area. And God's like, that's the one we're going to take down first. And it was going to set an example for the rest of the cities in the area as well. Jericho was like the toughest guy in the prison yard. And Joshua was about to go up and pick a fight with him. And God told Joshua to take them out first. And the way that God told Joshua to do that was just weird. He told Joshua to have the people march around the city walls once a day for six continuous days, or for six uh, consecutive days. Once a day for six consecutive days. On the seventh day, they were to march around the city of Jericho seven times. And at the end of the seventh time around on the seventh day, they were to blow their trumpets and shout. And that was going to take care of the walls of Jericho. And guess what? It happened just the way that God planned. God had a plan, an albeit unusual plan, to defeat the enemies facing Joshua. And he has a plan when it comes to facing your enemies as well. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, God details the plan that he has for defeating your enemies in your life as well. We know it as the armor of God. And it's an armor that is real. It's an armor that can't be seen with the naked eye, but it is based upon faith. We have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then don't forget, of course, prayer. And when you clothe yourself with the full armor of God, your enemies don't stand a chance. And that seems a little weird. And we like to think of battling our enemies in, in conventional ways, ways that seem to make sense to me. But what you need to understand is this, God has a plan when dealing with your enemies. And if you follow that plan, it's going to go so much better for you than if you try to do it on your own. God has a plan when I'm suffering, when I'm rebelling, when uh, he has a plan against my enemies. And then this next thing, and it couldn't be more relevant to us today, but I think it was also relevant to the people back in Paul's day as well. God has a plan when it comes to politics. Did you know that? Look at verses 20 through 23. After these things, God gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After, he had, after God had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do uh, my will. You know, it's interesting uh, God has a plan for politics, and I think that applies for us today, but it also applied back then. You've got to remember, Paul was living in the day of Roman occupation, right? And uh, the people who were living in the land didn't like the political leaders they had. But Paul was reminding them, look, God has had a plan. Even from the time of history, God has had a plan when it came to political leaders. And there's two things from these verses that I realize. First of all, God has a plan when the wrong leader is selected 
and God has a plan when the right leader is selected. You remember the history of Israel a little bit, don't you? They wanted to have a king rule over them. And what they failed to realize is that they had a king, and it was God. But they wanted a king that, that they could see physically with their eyes sitting on a throne. And God gave them what they wanted. And ever since that time, God's people have been caught up, it seems, in politics and in placing their faith in someone who sits on the throne. Saul was their first king. He didn't end well. But God had a plan even when the wrong one was selected. And then God had a plan when the right one was selected. David took over. He was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't perfect. He was far from it. But he loved God and he ultimately led God's people to follow after him. And in today's political climate, there are good leaders and there are bad leaders. There are leaders that you will agree with and there are leaders that you will not agree with. But remember this, God has a plan and he's in control. Don't get caught up in thinking that God is only in control when the right one is elected. God is always in control. And never forget this. He is your king. And then finally, Paul makes the transition by ending his sermon by saying this. He says uh, that God has a plan and his name is Jesus. Finishing out our text this morning, verses 23 through 26. From the descendants of this man, according to the promise, that's the, that's the descendants of David, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior named Jesus. After John the Baptist proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not the Messiah, I'm not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie." Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those living among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. And so Paul just made the seamless transition of, hey, God has a plan, let me show you about it throughout um, Jewish history, to God has a plan and his plan has always included Jesus Christ. Now what's amazing to me about these verses is that these people living up in Antioch, uh, Pisidian Antioch were familiar with the ministry of John the Baptist and John the Baptist served around Jerusalem and, and, and Judea and it really shouldn't be all that surprising that they knew who John the Baptist was because Jesus described John the Baptist as the greatest man who was ever to be born among women and since the people of Pisidian Antioch were familiar with John the Baptist and his ministry, no doubt they would have been familiar with the message that John the Baptist declared. And what was his message? His message was, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's here. Repent and come to him. And that's where I want to end our time together as well. In this first recorded sermon of Paul's, Paul wanted his audience to know that God's plan for them, included receiving Jesus. That, that has always been God's number one priority, your salvation. And that's God's plan for you today. So that's the first half of Paul's sermon. We didn't finish all of it. We, Lord willing, will finish it next week. God has a plan. Even when I'm suffering, when I'm rebelling against God, He's got a plan against my enemies. He's got a plan even in the political realm. But God's ultimate plan is found in Jesus Christ. And you can receive Him as your Lord and Savior today. He's been actively working this plan all throughout history. And next week, we're going to learn what God's plan of salvation can actively do for you personally. Because Paul will teach us that God's plan is so detailed that his plans include you and me. Let's stand together, let's pray, and we're going to offer a time decision here this morning. And if you've got a decision that needs to be made, this is going to be an opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's pray, and let's thank God for his plan. Shall we? Let's pray.